A very good evening, everyone. Welcome to iFocus Online, Lecture 235, uh, number 22 in our series on squint and pediatric ophthalmology. Today is a masterclass by Professor Pramod K. Pandey, uh, sir, from New Delhi. Uh, he'll be talking to us on paralytic strabismus, diagnostic tests with case examples. I request our chair, uh, Professor Pradeep Sharma, sir, to welcome him and introduce him to our audiences. Thank you, Dr. Shefali. It's again a pleasure to have Professor Pandey to deliver another masterclass in the series of iFocus online on strabismus. He has done his MDBS and MD both from, RP Center, uh, from Ames, New Delhi, ex-director professor of ophthalmology, Guru Nanak Eye Center, Malanazad Medical College, New Delhi. Currently, he is the adjunct professor at ESIC Medical College, Faridabad, and does a private practice at Synergy Eye Care, New Delhi. He has an extensive clinical teaching and research experience of about 35 years with 75 index publications in uh, index journals. He has held positions of being the past editor of SPOSI and now currently he's the secretary of uh, SPOSI. He has uh, several awards and accolades to his credit. The SD Athavle Award for Best Paper in Neuroophthalmology from AIOS 2009, Dr. P.K. Jain Oration from Delhi Ophthalmic Society 2019, and an inaugural annual AOS IJ award for the best letter to the editor. So I would like to invite Professor Pandey to present this masterclass. Dr. Shafali, you can yeah. share. Yes. Thank you, Professor Pradeep Sharma for a very nice introduction. And it is a pleasure and privilege we speaking on iFocus Forum. And uh, for the sake of students, I would like to say some basic things before we go on to the test for paralytic strabismus. Next. Now this is showing a lateral light animal, like a fish, which is lateral light. They have two fully crossed uh, optic uh, pathways. The right eye going to the left side of the brain and the left eye going to the right side of the brain. Their oblique muscles are the main actors. The recti are not so active. It is the obliques which take the fish down and up. The inferior obliques are the depressors and superior obliques are the elevators. Now from this ocean life, we came to the uh, terrestrial and arboreal life. Now with that, there was a change in the requirement for vision. We needed far better acuity of vision and also stereopsis. For that, our eyes moved forward. We became frontal eyed and we started fusing images. Now for this images to be fused, we need very, very accurate and precise coordination between the extraocular muscles. And the requirement as and when this fails, we have a strabismus. Other thing what is important I want to say at this point is that the obliques which were very important, fun uh, had very important function in uh, animals like fish, lateral light animals, they were, they were put to, relegated to side role because torsion became a liability when we came to binocular single vision in frontal light animals. So you will find that torsion has been put to the back seat and the recti have taken over most of the functions of the motility. Next one. Now this is showing a frontal light uh, animal climbing trees. For that we require very good visual acuity and stereopsis. Otherwise the fellow is going to fall down and he'll be eaten up or anywhere die of uh, just gravity. Next please. Now this is to show a bit about these three extraocular uh, uh, oculomotor nerves. The third one, the fourth one, and the sixth one. The third one, as we know, is a is a is, they have multiple subnuclei which are just grouped together. So it is prone for evident innervation, and it has it can also have nuclear lesions which can present in different ways depending upon the particular nucleus. You can have presentations which may involve a particular subnucleus. The fourth nerve is peculiar because it is the thinnest nerve. It is the only nerve which is exiting on the dorsum of the uh, midbrain. It is crossing in the anterior velum and running below the tentorium. So in these two places, it is very prone for injury. So the fourth nerve palsy is being, being the thinnest. You have the largest number of congenital fourth nerve palsies. And also you have very important group of conditions which are traumatic fourth nerve palsies. So these are these together are very important. Then you have the sixth nerve, which is coming from way down from the, arising in the lower part of the pons and ascending up 
as you can see along the clivus. So this, all this causes it to create uh, along the clivus, it is, has a long subarachnoid course, so it is prone to rise in intraocular pressure and all those issues and then rising, climbing up along the petrous part of the temporal bone. So the mid middle ear in area problems can also cause difficulties with the six nerve. Next. Now this is showing some uh, fellow travelers with these extraocular uh, uh, nuclei, the, the, the third, fourth and sixth nuclei. You can see there is a, these are the vestibular nuclei here, which are close to the sixth nerve. Now sixth nerve is also having interneurons for the for the opposite medial rectus subnucleus. So these interneurons, so sixth nerve, if there is a lesion in the sixth nerve, it is going to cause a gaze palsy, not an isolated sixth nerve palsy. This is important to remember. And these interneurons are going to cross over at the level of the uh, six nerve nucle nuclei and go to the opposite MLF, ascend in the MLF. This is MLF and go and synapse in the third nerve nucleus in this part. Now there is also a fourth nerve nucleus which is lying here and close to third nerve you have what we say is interstitial nucleus of Kahal, which is very important for the um, torsional eye movements. And you also have posterior commissure, which is lying close by, which is where the vertical gaze fibers are crossing over to the other side. You also have RIMLF, which is very important for the vertical sockets. And you have PPRF here in the pons close to the six nerve nucleus. So for firing the sockets, you have PPRF for horizontal sockets. And for vertical sockets, you have RIMLF. Next one, please. Now this is showing the gravis septal pathways. You can see that from starting from the vestibule, they are going to ascend with the vestibular nerve, go to the vestibular nuclei. And from the vestibular nuclei, they'll cross again with the sixth nerve to the opposite side and ascend in the MLF till the RIMLF. So any lesion along this path, these pathways are important for vestibular ocular reflex and also important for ocular tilt reaction or what we call a skew deviation. So whenever you have a lesion here, as it is showing, if the lesion is before the fibers have crossed, then it is going to be left ocular tilt reaction because in this, you can see the tilt is to the left side. The torsion is also conjugate torsion, which we'll be talking about, and the left eye is lower and right eye is hyper. So now these three components are known as ocular tilt reaction. So any lesion anywhere can give rise to ocular tilt reaction along the pathway. And if there is a lesion, this will also reflex, uh, affect the vestibular ocular reflex. Next one, please. Now this is showing extraocular muscles. We have had, I think, this basic anatomy must have been taught. Only thing I want to say that there is a compartmentalization of innervation in most of the extraocular muscles, particularly the lateral rectus and the superior oblique. The lateral rectus has a superior compartment and an inferior comp compartment, and the superior oblique has a anterior and posterior compartment. Same is true with the inferior oblique and superior rectus. For the inferior rectus, this aspect is not fully known. So this can affect the clinical picture because inner innervation is in compartment. So there could be issues like torsion, which can happen with six nerve palsy, for example, or you may have fourth nerve palsy, which may only affect, which may only give rise to torsional issues predominantly, or may only give rise to a vertical or abducting effect, whatever. So depending upon which fibers are affected, there could be a selective involvement. Next, please. Now this is just showing types of uh, ocular movements, as you all know. There are five types. We are basically concerned uh, in this talk about vestibular ocular and saccadic eye movements. Rest are, of course, very important, but in this class, these two are uh, relevant. Next one, please. Now, in the paralytic strabismus, the nuts and bolts, you can see that three, I mean, one can say that this is most of these are incompetent. So it is very, or incompetence may be very subtle. So one may miss it. So if it is uh, paralytic, it is very likely to be almost always in confidence distribution because there is a problem with the innovation of the two sides. This could also be either they are congenital or they are acquired. So as we said that fourth nerve palsies are the commonest uh, involvement as a congenital fourth nerve palsy and acquired of course you can have third, fourth, sixth and other pre-nuclear involvements which can be there. And there could also be along with this parity component there could also be a mechanical component. So if there has been a paresis which has been lasting for some time, the antagonist is going to undergo contracture and this may add to the problem. So even if the paresis has dissolved, this um, uh, mechanical component may be there, 
which may be affecting the movement of this eye into whatever direction of the gaze. So it is important to know and think about pyretic component and be able to take that into account. Next one, please. Now, laws of motility, as you know, as we were talking that uh, we need a very precise uh, coordination between the extraocular muscles to maintain fixation on object of regard and we have a foveal fixation, bifoveal fixation. So for that, we need laws because otherwise things will go haywire. And you, I think uh, all of you are aware about evolved Herring's law of equal innervation. That means if one LR is getting what, some amount of innervation, the same innervation is going to flow to the yoke of the other eye, that is medial rectus. Sherrington's law, you know, of reciprocal innervation. That means if the LR is getting some innervation, the medial rectus of the same side will relax by, by the same amount. So once one is being fired, the ipsilateral antagonist is going to get same amount of inhibitional innervation. Now there is also inhibition palsy of the contralateral antagonist. This is important consideration, I think, which tend to overlook. What it means is that if there is a palsy of the left lateral rectus, the right lateral rectus also is underacting. So it may look like as if there is a bilateral lateral rectus involvement. So actually it is unilateral. When you make him fixate with the unaffected eye, then this is going to disappear. So it is important to keep in mind that there could be an inhibition passage of the contralateral antagonist. In the cyclovertical muscles context, it will apply to like if you have a superior oblique palsy, it will mean that the superior rectus of the opposite eye is having inhibition palsy. Or if you have an inferior oblique palsy, it will imply that the inferior rectus of the opposite eye is having inhibition palsy. So in cyclovertical muscles, things are slightly more complicated to understand. But in case of lateral rectus, it implies that the other lateral rectus is going to be affected. Next one. Next, please. Now, Donders and Listing's laws are, these are important, but somehow we don't talk about much. Donders law means that the orientation of the eyes is always the same when the eyes are aimed in a particular gaze direction. And Listing's law says, specifies that these orientations are, they, the axis used to rotate the eyes is confined to a single plane, that is Listing's plane. So that means that whatever eye position it has come to, the, the no matter what route it has taken, the eye position is going to be the same. So these are important laws to keep in mind when we are talking about the motility. Listing's law basically says that we cannot have too much of uh, torsion. This is basically to restrain or a sort of tame torsion. So this, as I was saying in the very beginning, that this sort of restores and controls this torsion. Because if torsion is not controlled, binocular single vision cannot take place and there is going to be a problem. Next, please. Now this is showing three planes. You can see that there is a roll plane, there is an interaural of pitch, and there is a y-axis. So in the roll, you have what you have movement in the Roll plane is like what you have in tilt. In the piece plane, you have oblique muscle overactions, which can mean that there is um, uh, inferior oblique or superior oblique overactions and underactions. And in the yaw plane, you have torsional issues. So these are fixed axis. These the movements take place along these three planes. Next, please. Now, in neurological uh, situations, there are basically three things which are important, the sight, age, and activity of the lesion. Now, lesions in our situation can be either they are pre-nuclear, as we were talking, that there is a skew deviation, there is an intranuclear ophthalmoplegia, or there is a, could be a pre syndrome. The lesions could also be nuclear, as we have been talking about the third nerve, that there are different subnuclei, and you can have an isolated involvement of particular subnucleus, and you may have a presentation which can be quite uh, complex. Then you can have fascicular lesions, which again will be subject to which uh, nerve we are talking about, the fascicles, the uh, structures which are coming along the fascicle. And then in the subarachnoid space, again, we have different kind of presentations in the cavernous sinus orbit and at neuromuscular junction, as we all know that there could be myasthenia gravis or it could be at the level of the extraocular muscles. So lesion is possible along all these uh, locations and the presentation may be will be subject to the presentations in those different parts. So the nuclear may be different from cavernous sinus and vice versa. So we need to know what are the what type of presentation it is so that one may be able to know that we could be dealing with a nuclear lesion or with a lesion, say, in the cavernous sinus. 
Next one, please. Now in the workup, we need to take history, particularly age of onset, the symptoms like strabismus, abnormal head posture, double vision, associated symptoms. In deviation, we need to know about ocular motility evaluation. Is it isolated or non-isolated? Very important. Like in a six now palsy, if you don't look at uh, disc, there could be a papilledema and you may miss it. So always look for other signs which could give rise to uh, involvement of uh, non-isolated, which can be far more serious matter. And then, of course, what has happened to that condition? That has it improved? Has it got better? Or is it worse or it is the same? Investigations done, treatment taken, and response to therapy, all these uh, issues are important. Next one, please. Now, this is another aspect. I think diplopia, we, as residents, I have seen they don't uh, take any history or any uh, workup about diplopia. And uh, they just ask, huh, there is a diplopia, and that's the end of it. I think this aspect needs to be stressed that we need to take proper uh, history about diplopia because it may give you a lot of insight and uh, knowledge about what has happened. So diplopia, we need to know is it sudden or gradual in onset? Is it, what are the associated symptoms like pain, redness? Pain could also be in, say, headache because if you have a say, six no palsy because of diabetes, you may have a six. Uh, you may have pain, which may be there for some time. There could be redness, proptosis, headaches. Sensory and motor signs could also be there. there. Are there any previous episodes? Is the diplopia horizontal, vertical, or torsional, or mixed? This is again important because nobody likes to. They don't elicit this history. So it's important to know: is it only horizontal? Is it also vertical? Or there is also a torsional component, which people may not complain of torsional component quite often, but once you elicit it, then you, it may be obvious. Is it intermittent or is it constant? Very important to know that what kind of thing you could be dealing with. Is there any diagonal variation? Because it may tell you that is it a thyroid problem or is it myasthenia gravis? What has been the course of this diplopia? Has it got better or has it got worse? And most important, how it affects patients' uh, life and how and is, uh, it is the course. How does it affect patients' life? I mean, how is he affected? And how does he overcome this? And maybe the last thing would be the treatment taken and what has been response to the to that treatment. So we need to know a bit more about diplopia, and I think this aspect needs to be stressed. Next one, please. Now, what not to miss in these cases? Visual acuity, BCBA, very important because the fixing eye may be different, the paretic eye may be right, and if the vision is poor in this eye, patient may be fixing with the other eye. So visual acuity, it may also affect your binocular cooperation and uh, deviation. So VA has to be taken and BCBA also. Pulpular pressure changes, is there any ptosis or there is any lip retraction? Is there any nystagmus, aberrant ocular movements? Facial nerve function, we need to look, like if you have a myasthenia gravis or something, facial nerve could be weak. Abnormal head posture, again, is important. It can be subtle and it may be missed. So we need to look at abnormal head posture carefully. Next one, please. Now this is showing an AHP of face turn. It, AHP could be taken to optimize visual equity. It may be there to maintain binocularity to center the field of binocular vision, or there could be miscellaneous reasons for AHP. Next one. Now, face turn, classically, we see in the sectional palsy, which may be to the same, if there is sectional palsy to the left, the face will be turned to the same side. This is to avoid action in that particular side. And other conditions which can also give rise to similar face turn could be nystagmus or cyclovertical muscle palsy, for example, SOP. Because some of these SOPs may not adopt the classical tilt. They may just abduct the, put the eye into abduction to avoid movement from the, in, in the abduction because there the deviation is more. So they may just do a face turn and avoid the area where eye is going to rise up to where it is going to elevate. So that is also possible. Others are not important. Once in a while, you may have them. Next one, please. Chin up and chin down, you can have in bilateral probably palsy or process depending on situation and pattern strabismus. Next one. Now, tilts are, again, they are classically seen in cyclovertical muscle palsies, as we all know. They could also be seen in nystagmus, DVD, infantile isotropias. They could be mechanical causes like IR contracture, orbital fractures, and browns. And another important thing is ocular tilt reaction should be talking at the end, which can also give rise to classically a tilt, which is part of the presentation of 
uh, of nucleus reaction. Next one, please. This is showing a classical uh, fill to the left side in a child, which has different phases of growth. You can see it's a very typical and consistent tilt this child has shown. So you can have cases where tails are very, um, uh, very typical and they can be atypical presentations also. And it, may, it is not essential that every superior oblique palsy is going to have a tail. Some may not have a tail and very few may also have a tail to the opposite side to increase the separation of images so that they are not troubled by diplopia or they are able to have sensory adaptation. So it is it's not that it is always a must and this is always must be there. And it may also vanish when the child is lying down. Next one. Now, when, when we look at the deviation, we need to look at what is the deviation in primary position and in force primary. We just talk about the AHP. So we need to see that what is the deviation in primary position and force primary, because if you don't neutralize the tilt, the, phase, the, 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 the uh, abnormal rate posture, then there may be no deviation. So one thing important to keep in mind that if AHP is there, it has to be eliminated. We need to look at deviation at near end distance. Like in six no palsy, you may have more isotropia, iso deviation at distance as compared to near. And there could be situations which could be other way around also. We very important to keep in mind that there could be a primary and secondary deviation. The primary deviation is always less than secondary deviation. We all know that secondary deviation is when the person is fixing with the eye which is affected. So by the Herring's law, there is going to be more innovation. So the other eye is going to deviate more. We also need to look at deviation in nine cardinal gauges with either eye fixing, and we need to know which is the fixing eye and fixation preference because person could be fixing with a normal eye, or maybe out of the two eyes, both could be abnormal, both could be having a motility problem. So he may be fixing accordingly. So it's not a must that person is fixing with a normal eye or unaffected eye. Let's say. Next one. This is showing a patient with six now palsy. As you can see, there is an abduction. Deficit and there is overaction of the yoke medial rectus and the ipsilateral medial rectus and inhibition pulse is not very well seen. And in these cases, if you look at deviation at distance, it is definitely quite consistently more than what it is at near. There could also be a V pattern if uh, it is bilateral and there could also be papilledema, which should always keep in mind. And if it is a bilateral 6 no palsy, it always needs to be investigated and imaged. So don't sit lightly on bilateral six node involvement. Next one, please. Now talking about deviation, now you can also have deviation, which is horizontal, which is vertical. And uh, so in this case, it becomes complicated. Like you have eye, which is going down and eye, which is rising. The eye, the right eye is falling and the left eye is rising in adduction and there is a large HO and also a V pattern. So this is basically a case of uh, left superior rectus, uh, superior oblique palsy and right brown. So such presentations can also be there. So in such cases, you have to neutralize the larger deviation first and then neutralize the smaller deviation. And uh, depending upon the situation, you have to see. Next one, please. Now in the motility, we need to look at versions, ductions and vergences. If versions are fine, maybe we need not look at Ductions, but if versions are affected, we do need to look at ductions that how much movement is able to take place with ductions. We have to grade under actions and over actions, over elevations and under elevations, which we call as uh, in, in instead of over actions and under actions, it is better to call them over elevations and under elevations or over depressions and under depressions because we don't know that this over action is because of the same inferior oblique or there is a Duane syndrome. So just because there is an uh, over elevation in adduction, it does not automatically mean that this is because of the inferior oblique over action. So that has to be kept in mind that there could be our pulley problems. So all those issues are there. So it should not be presumed that just because the eye is elevating or depressing, it must be inferior oblique or superior oblique. Next one, please. This is showing our left uh, congenital SOP, you can see the right congenital SOP, sorry. And you can see that there is uh, elevation in adduction and there is also under, you can see here, this side is elevating more, this is under depression. And there is slight B, you can see an up gaze, there is slight divergence. So all these findings, there is also vertical here. And this still part we'll be talking in the next slide when we talk about three-step test, Parks three-step test. Next one, please. 
This is showing an acquired left superior oblique palsy. You can again see here that there is under action of the superior oblique hair, which is far more prominent as compared to the previous one. In the congenital superior oblique palsies, the inferior oblique overaction is far more important than superior oblique underaction. Whereas in acquired, quite often you find the superior oblique underaction, which may be far more frequently seen as compared to inferior oblique overaction will develop to some extent, but superior oblique underaction can also be an important uh, finding. Next one, please. This is showing a case of congenital left inferior oblique palsy. You can see that. Uh, the left eye is not rising and there is overaction of the superior oblique and there is an A ESO in the up gaze. If it were browns, then it is going to be a B pattern and the eye will not rise even in elevation. So this is not a very common presentation, but you do, do see once in a while in cases with inferior oblique palsy. Next one. Now coming to the three-step test, as we all know that if it is the, uh, we just saw this child, so what, what is happening here is that there are three steps. One is that what is the deviation in primary position? Now, in this case, there is a right hypertropia, as you can see. Now, we need to see deviation in the side gazes. Now, in this, in the deviation is increasing in, you can see in the left gaze. There is over elevation in left gaze. So that means either this is right superior oblique or left superior rectus. If it were increasing on the opposite side, let us say here, that would mean that it is either uh, inferior rectus of the right side or inferior oblique of the left side. So depending upon which side the deviation is increasing, you two muscles are eliminated. So if you're lucky, I mean, it doesn't happen in all the cases because if there is a spread of comatins, it doesn't happen that um, decisively. Now in the third step, you tilt the head about 45 degrees either side and you make the patient fixate that distance and you see what is happening. You can see clearly that this, this right eye is elevating much more as compared to this. There is an increase in hyper as compared to this. So this shows that this is a right superior oblique palsy. Now, why does it, this happen? Because what is happening on the tip that the intortus of the, in this case, the intortus of the right side that is superior rectus and superior oblique are going to act. And when we tilt and the extortus of the left eye are going to act on right tilting. And when we tilt the head to the left side, the intortus of the left side, that is superior rectus and superior oblique, and the extortus in the left eye, that is in the other eye will be acting. So here, because the superior oblique is paralyzed, you can see that the superior rectus is able to pull the eye up. So that is the reason for increase in deviation in this head tilt test and uh, this is basically a ocular counter role which is a physiological phenomenon so we are utilizing and exploiting this to diagnose cyclovertical muscle palsies so the thing is broadly that if the eye is eleva elevating in adduction and it is on the opposite side then it is the as in this case this is either so and sr and if it is on the right side this is either ir and io other thing to keep in mind is if it is the hyper eye, like in this case, we have the right eye, which is hyper. So if on tilting head to the right side, it is increasing, that means it is either superior oblique or the inferior oblique of the other side. Now, if the deviation is increasing, if it is positive on the side of the hypo eye, that means it is either inferior rectus or superior rectus. So that way one can distinguish what which cyclovertical muscle could be affected. Next one, please. Now this is this can be a vagrant test like you have uh, here both ways things are rising so if there is more than one muscle involved obviously it's going to create issues so it's not that it is going to help in every situation idea was to show that it can be vagrant and create problems so you cannot look at any single test in isolation that this is going to give you 100 percent outcomes next one please now uh, three step test can have a lot of vagrancies as you can see like in each step you can have it may not come as positive, like in step one, you may not have a vertical in primary because there could be a large uh, vertical fusional amplitude, particularly in uh, uh, congenital superior oblique palsy, so you may not have a vertical. And uh, same way, step two, if there is a spread of comitance, it may not come as positive. Or step three also, if there is a, a lesion in the inner ear, on one side, it is not going to 
come as positive. So I'm just trying to give an example that there could be situations that any of these steps could may not come as positive. And you know, quite often you find that two steps are positive and one step may not come as positive. Now, the multiple muscle palsies, it can happen, fully abnormalities, DVD. DVD usually gives head tilt test positive on the opposite side of the hyper. There could be a restrictive strabismus, like if you have an IR contracture <coughs> of one side, it may present as superioblique palsy of the opposite side. If you have a large horizontal deviation, because if the eye in an XO, if the eye is in abduction, the superior rectae are working more than the superior oblique. So on that tilt, there is this eye is going to go hyper. Same way, the eye is in ESO, it can happen that the superior oblique is able to work more, and there is a this eye is uh, going down. So depending upon large ESO and XO, you can also have. That this may be positive and skewed divisions, of course, they can mimic and create problems with this uh, three step test. Next one, please. Now, this can be, as I said, that this could be positive in occlutal reaction. We will not be able to go in the detail that both superior oblique palsy and pre oblique palsy can be mixed up, and there is just a skew, and you may diagnose them wrong. Next one, please. Now, diplopia charting is again, again very important. It is a subjective test, and this is based on diplopia principle. You make person wear red and green glasses for dissociation, and done at 50 centimeters or one meter, not at 33 centimeters, because then you'll be inviting near vision complex. Head must be straight, very important, and patient's right and left has to be indicated. Which eye is projecting red image has to be indicated, and distance of the fixation light has to be indicated. So all these. Things have to be there on the screen and separation of images, horizontal, vertical, and proximal has to be shown. Next one, please. This is showing a, uh, the propia charting. You can you can see in the left lateral rectus uh, under action that uh, this is homonymous, that the left side the green one is on the uh, this is homonymous diplopia, and separation has to be shown in centimeters, jitna water separation is there of the images, and there's no tilt here. So important to record those parameters so that when you take it next time, whenever you are examining the patients after one month or two months, then you are able to match it with the previous record, what has happened to that. Next one, please. Now, Hess and Lee's chart principles, see, all know, see this is, a, that was on uh, diplopia and this is on haploscopic uh, principle. That means we are dissociating the eyes either by red, green, uh, this thing, or we are having, uh, mirror which is separating the two eyes so it is a haploscopic device so the patient must mirror must have a plane surface and should bisect the screens equally patient should be positioned across i mean appropriately and head must be straight it works on foveal fixation so and uh, so if, the, if there is no foveal fixation it is going to give wrong reason may give uh, erroneous uh, findings and it should be performed preferably without glasses it's not a must but at times, glasses frames may create obstacles. Next one, please. Now, shortcomings are either separation, if there's gross limitation of movements, then this may will not be appropriate. Next one. Now, interpretation, we know that the, we have to compare the position, size, and shape. Position means central dot is in the primary position, and higher fields belong to the higher eye as compared to diplopia, where the higher image belongs to the eye, which is hypotropic. Smaller fields belong to the affected eye. The under actions of inward displacement, displacement will be seen, and over actions will be seen by outward displacement. Narrow field will mean an opposing directions, if like in uh, 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 restrictive strabismus. Next one. This is showing in the case of third no palsy, as you can see, there is a constriction, and the other eye there is a uh, large field. Next one. This is left superior oblique. You can see the under action of the superior oblique and over action of the inferior rectus in the other eye. Next one. So important to keep this, this is a uh, right lateral rectus. So important to keep these records so that you can compare them later. Next one. This is bilateral six no palsy. So all these uh, can be recorded and kept for future reference. Next. Now this is field of binocular single vision, which can be recorded where there is some area where there is a binocular single vision and there is some area where there is a diplopia. So like six no palsy, this can be record can be done and kept for later reference. Next one. Now for the test for muscle function, we need to look at paresis, palsy, and restriction. We need to do 
post reduction test, post generation test, guidance, uh, exit reduction test for the optics, psychotic velocity, and dynamic MRI and EMG. Next one. Now, this is showing FDT, very important. This can show that if the restriction is absolute or it is uh, linear, like in Brown syndrome, there is an absolute restriction. You can't just take it up. Or if there is a contracture in a muscle, this is like a linear restriction. That means as you move the eye along the uh, path of course of the muscle, there the restriction is going to increase. Now, there could be a leash phenomena. That means either a direct leash or indirect leash. leash if there is a direct leash, it is in the opposite direction. And indirect leash is like browns that towards the area of the muscle, there only there is. If the leash is posterior, then it is going to act like indirect leash. And if the mechanical uh, uh, restriction is anterior, this may act like indirect leash. So depending upon where it is located, it is anterior to the equator or posterior, it may behave either as direct or indirect. Now you can do it in office setting or during surgery. Very important to do during surgery because as you do surgery, you detach the muscle or you attach the muscle, you can see what is happening. The pit for the patient could be apprehensive, so he may not allow you to do it properly. So a uh, person has to be relaxed. You have to give proper anesthesia. And there could be false positive or negative. If you press the eye too much down, this may be that it may come as uh, negative. And if person is not uh, cooperative, it may come as false positive. There could also be a paresis and restriction in these cases and poor contraction. Next one, please. Now, muscle force generation test, this could be, this is uh, done like in six no palsy, you can have um, uh, direction of the lateral rectus. Now, this could be done either grasping on the paretic side or also grasping on the opposite side, that is on the medial rectus side. So, uh, like we were doing the FDT, you can also do the, with the same forcep. That you ask the patient to look in the direction of the lateral rectus and you try to push the uh, apply force towards medial is to see how strong is the pulling force of the lateral rectus. This is better way because it avoids injury to the cornea or to it may also I mean damage the conjunctiva if too much of force is applied. But here, once we are grasping on the same side, like for the lateral rectus, in this case, if there is a lot of force, this may tear the conjunctiva or even cause an abrasion. So while doing FDT, one should be careful or even FDT in older people, it may definitely cause a subconjunctival hemorrhage. Uh, so one has to be careful. Next one, please. This is showing clinical psychiatric velocity about 20 degrees from uh, abduction to say about 10 degrees abduction. So you don't have to take it in the extreme abduction for the six no palsy in this case. And you see with two fingers, uh, you from one to other, you can see how much is the velocity. And you have to compare it with the agonist of the, that is medial rectus, and maybe the lateral rectus of the other eye also. So you get a relative idea how much force is there. Next one, please. Now, cognitive psychotic velocity can be done if there are indications like mild paresis, there's paresis versus restriction, lost lip muscle, oculomyasthenia gravis. In these cases, you may be able to get additional information by doing a quantitative psychotic velocity assessment like EOG, infrared scleral reflection technique or scleral search for us. Next one. This is uh, showing guidance uh, traction test for optics. Now it is important to push the globe down into the orbit and take the eye up superior nasally and then take it temporally. The idea is to put this muscle, uh, the superior oblique on maximum space. This can also be done for the uh, inferior oblique and then you rotate, I mean, uh, Rotate it and see how much resistance is there because it's going to slip over the taut tendon. Now, this needs a lot of practice. Initially, if you are just doing it for the first time, it's not going to be very uh, accurate. And you also need to do during surgery. So, in normal people also, when they are being operated, one can do and see how well it is coming. So, it is more by experience and you compare with the other eye to know what is the difference between the two eyes. Next one, please. This can be graded accordingly how lax or tight is the tendon and accordingly you can do surgery on this tendon this is more useful for congenital superior oblique palsy next one please now torsion is as we were talking very important and uh, we have learned as binocular single vision to sort of uh, stem it and uh, so that it doesn't bother us because if there is a lot of torsion there is going to be breakdown of the binocular single vision so we have learned a lot of sensory adaptations also so if you have a child which gets a postnormal palsy, it is before eight years, it is not going to have subjective torsion. He may have only objective torsion. So if uh, the 
any any congenital strabismus will not have subjective torsion it will have only objective torsion whereas strabismus is acquired after the age of eight years it may have subjective and objective torsion both now it is basically disc phobia relationship where the phobia lies in the lower third of the disc and the methods could be either objective as i was saying that you do indirect ophthalmoscopy fundus photography blind spot marking and skill search coil for subjective you have double mandox rod lancaster red green test and begonis striated glasses now the, D, the double mandox rod both have to be red because if it is one white the patient may localize to the red side another thing is the room has to be dark room should be fully dark though so there should be no peripheral cues and you have to show the torch at about one meter or so and tell the patient to rotate the mandox rods accordingly for uh, indirect ophthalmoscopy you have to and you have to see that there, the head should be, there should be no uh, head should be straight because if he adopts head posture that will affect torsion if he tilts his head it is going to affect torsion same way with io you have to the light has to be dim and patient has to be fixating at the uh, indirect ophthalmoscope light so that precaution has to be taken next one please this is showing normal torsion you can see that this is in the lower third of the disc if it goes up the phobia we call it in torsion if it goes below the lower disc margin we call it in torsion next one please this is again you can see that the both phobia have gone much below the inferior border of the disc so this is bilateral extorsion which can classically be seen in a bilateral superior oblique palsy or primary inferior oblique overaction next one please this is conjugate torsion. You can see that the right eye is having in torsion and the left eye is having in extorsion. This is classically seen in ocular tilt reactions or skew deviations. So it is very classical of those. So when you see this, you must always think of a skew deviation or ocular tilt reaction. Next one, please. This is showing that in skew deviation, when the person is lying down, there can be the vertical deviation and uh, torsion can disappear or may come down. So it is a good test. That if you are suspecting a skew deviation, you make them lie down, take their torsion in supine position. It may change. If it changes, it is suggestive of a skew deviation. Next one, please. This is showing that torsion after six months, it can, after one year, you can see in this case, it has it has recovered. So torsion can change with time. And especially in skew deviations, it can change and it may disappear. And these patients with skew deviation don't complain of torsion frequently because that is the adaptation it is not that patient may not even be aware of that abnormal torsion next one please now investigations we need to do is thyroid workup depending upon the situation blood glucose hemoglobin a1c lipid profile and anti acgrab antibodies maybe in cases where we suspect myasthenia next one now imaging when to image not all cases need to be imaged if you are dealing with ischemic palsy you may wait but if you go to neurologist or if you go to west they would like to image all of these but i think in our setting where imaging is not very clearly available you may wait three months and only if it is not resolving then you may subject them to imaging after three months or so and younger children of course have to be imaged younger below 40 all have to be imaged next one I will just see some presentations. Next one, please. This is showing a traumatic left superior oblique palsy. You can see the head abnormal head posture to the right side. Next one. This is showing nine gaze. You can see the elevation in the left eye on adduction and the underaction of the left eye on depression, classically seen in acquired superior oblique palsy. They have a lot of torsion mm -hmm. and the torsion issues are really bothersome and they might need a harad too, depending upon their torsional status. Next one. <coughs> this is showing tilt you can see on the left tilt the eye is elevating so this is coming this is showing extortion in the left eye next one next one this is showing a bilateral superior oblique only in abduction you can see that the eye is slightly going up which can be very subtle there is a v pattern that means the eyes are going in exo in up gaze and maybe eso in down gaze there could also be an eso deviation which is present because the superior obliques are adductors so it, you may think it is a six no palsy, but this is actually <coughs> a bilateral fourth no palsy, and they can come on tilt in one eye because this could be masked in the other eye. So you may get positive head tilt on one side. Next one, please. This is showing extortion in both eyes, which has improved after thyroid eye to surgery, which has been done. Next one. This is showing an ocular tilt reaction left and left eye. You know, you can see that this eye is not adducting. 
this eye is not left eye is not abducting and there is this face this is still to the left side and this eye is hyper so this is a left i left um, otr with left eye you know that means the lesion is in the left medial longitudinal fasciculus or what we call as mlf next one this is showing uh, that conjugate torsion the left eye is hyper and the right eye is sorry left eye is intorted and right eye is extorted so this is classical conjugate torsion which you see in ocular tilt reaction so the lesion is somewhere in the left medial longitudinal fasciculus next one please this is showing a pretechnical syndrome. As we said that there is a posterior commissure where these upgrade fibers are crossing. So if there's a lesion like a thalamic hemorrhage, this can affect uh, this part. And you have uh, upgaze palsy, also downgaze palsy. You have midbrain pupils, which are semi-dilated pupils. And you may also have an oclotil reaction. You may also have things like third nerve palsy, depending upon how big is the lesion. So the presentation can be quite complex in these situations. Like here, there is no, it looks like as if there is a third bilateral third nerve palsy. Look at the motility, but there is no tosis. And the pupils are not very well seen, that they are slightly dilated in both the eyes. Convergence could be affected. The exo part could be quite often they may go in for an exo or some go for ESO, some go for exo. Next one, please. And there is a late retraction in these cases quite often. And in this tilt, they may come depending upon which side ocular tilt reaction is there. Next one. Here you can see that this was the left ocular tilt reaction because the left is extorted and right is intorted. So the right eye was hyper, should be hyper, and left eye should be hyper. So if you look at this kind of torsion, which is conjugate, you must always think of by and large is skew deviation. Now that all the cases will have this, some may have only extortion in one eye, they may not have intorsion in the other eye. So all those combinations are possible. But you must, if you find this classical presentation, you must always look for a skew deviation. That is a very important differential. Next one. Now, this is showing a girl with uh, myasthenia gravis, not very common to see in this age group, but we just saw it recently. Looks like as if there is a bilateral six now palsy, and uh, she must be having a big lesion in the uh, brain or cavernous sinus, but there are no other signs. Pupils are not affected. And uh, if you do an ice test, quite often they are going to respond. and. Uh, uh, we put her on therapeutic trial and she did not show very good response, uh, though she did respond, but not as good, uh, both uh, pyridostigmine and prednisolone. And then she was lost to follow up. So if you are not, uh, if you're not able to diagnose, uh, you should keep myasthenia gravis also in mind, in back of your mind. Don't treat it as primary diagnosis, but always think of it, keep it in back of your mind if the person is diabetic. If the person is having thyroid disorder, these such cases, they are also autoimmune conditions. So if you have those, then you should also think of myasthenia or a younger person. And uh, they may have those classical presentations. They may not have that classical presentation like fatigue and all those. But quite often, if you do an uh, ICE test, a good number, about 50% or so, will have a positive result. And uh, ptosis responds uh, faster as compared to extraocular motility. Uh, limitations. So, first thing to respond in these cases is usually uh, ptosis. <coughs> Motility part may take longer to respond, and you do need to investigate them for ACHR, AB, and other uh, antibodies, which would be there. And older people, you may also need to look for a thymoma, which could be affecting the picture, or eaton Lambert syndrome. All those things are there. It's a big area. We cannot, uh, we don't have time to discuss all that. So in young children also, you can see once in a while, so this is a six year old and she was been to so many places and uh, she was not diagnosed. So uh, diagnosis, which is quite often missed and may look like a gaze palsy, may look like an intranuclear ophthalmopedia, may look like bilateral third nerve. And some of these cases, a good number may pass for generalized myasthenia also, but if they remain, then they are uh, ocular myasthenia. If they remain only ocular for two years, we put them as ocular myasthenia. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for that talk. I think I present uh, finished on time. Yes, sir. Very Whatever much. Whatever time I was given. Yes, sir. We have time for discussion also and lots of pictures, which is always so beneficial because it registers so much more. Uh, and good evening, Amitava, sir. Welcome. Yeah, sir. good evening. I'm so sorry. I was a little caught up with uh, some personal issues, so I, I couldn't come on time. But you're right on time. Apo for apologies. Yeah. <laughs> uh, sir, any uh, remarks from you, sir, Pradeep, sir? 
before you go on to the questions uh, i think it was a nice comprehensive uh, lecture on the diagnostic test i think uh, it would be uh, nice we can have the questions of the people then specifically we can have those studies because this is just the beginning of the paralytic strabismus yes, and sir. we are going to have more lectures on specific nerve palsies so let's see what kind of questions people have okay so the first question is how do we differentiate between primary and secondary deviation no primary this is a very basic questions like if you have a left six now palsy if you fix with the right eye that is primary deviation if you fix with the left eye the deviation is going to be more so that is secondary deviation the reason being that the left six uh, the left uh, lateral lectus is parietic now to bring this eye to primary position it needs more innervation now if this needs more innervation the medial lectus of the fellow eye is also going to get same innervation because that is yoked so this is going to increase the eso so that is why always whenever the secondary deviation is always more than primary deviation because you are fixating with the parietic muscle that is i think very important to keep in mind and at times if there is very subtle difference it may not be always very gross you can put a red glass test and ask the patient that the separation with the images either i uh, fixing is there any difference so he may tell us if there is subtle difference he may be able to say that yes it is more with either eye so that can be done uh next is can you explain the concept of inhibitional palsy inhibitional palsy we just talked that if you have a left six nerve palsy the left right six nerve is also underacting that is because by herring's law the medial rectus is overacting of the of the other eye so if that is overacting the other lateral rectus is underacting so you can explain and by that so because this is all as per the sherrington's law and herring's law so this is subject to those laws of mutability that same innervation is going to flow to the mr of the opposite eye and the mr of the same eye affected eye is going to be inhibited so the lr is also drawing the same innervation from the as the mr is and so this is going to be underacting so the best way to know is that if you make him fixate with the non so called unaffected eye this inhibition pathway is going to disappear it's not going to be there so it's only when person is fixating with the affected eye it's basically indicating that uh, the muscle has to work against a stronger opponent so in the normal eye the uh, contralateral uh, lateral lectus is going to be working against the, me the medial lectus which is having extra innervation because it is the yoke of a paralytic muscle so as dr pande was saying in the first part whenever there will be a paralytic lateral lectus the contralateral medial rectus which is this uh, synergist in the other eye for a uh, the, it will receive much more innervation and that will go into a contracture so the normal lateral rectus of the other eye would have to work extra so that's why it appears as if it's a palsy so this is an inhibitional palsy and the best way to differentiate would be to patch the paralytic eye for some time so that this change of innervation which has happened will be reset so because this is an innervational problem uh, because the paralytic lateral rectus requires more innervation the contralateral medial rectus or the synergist gets more innervation so the contralateral lateral rectus which is the opponent of the synergist of the paralytic muscle will have to work more so it appears to be paralytic yes yeah, so and this is also important if you are look first part of the uh, quest, the first question was of the recent onset paralytic strabismus that we have that there will be a, a secondary versus primary deviations whereas the second the second question is more likely to be seen in a uh, spread of comitance so it is little more prolonged time so that may appear and it can also create issues in uh, cyclo vertical muscle palsy like if you have superior oblique palsy on the right side the superior rectus on the left eye could be underacting so one needs to be look at mutility carefully so you if you patch the paralytic eye then you would know that the superior rectus which was appearing to be having inhibitional palsy would recover so it would not have any underaction so if you that is the way to differentiate okay uh next one is in management of diplopia secondary secondary to paralytic strabismus apart from occlusion what are the other options to alleviate uh, diplopia 
diplopia are you talking in horizontal diplopia depending upon which muscle is affected i think that's going to make a difference and age group and kind of etiology i think you are having if it is an ischemic etiology which you think is likely to recover in an old man of 60 so that may be different than if there is a tumor or something which is going to be not going to recover maybe you can also give botulinum toxin in some of these cases uh, those which are because that will also prevent contracture. If there's a large deviation and uh, this happens, then that will also prevent contracture. So one can do that thing, but you have to see what kind of etiology you are dealing with and what is the likely course. And accordingly, I think one has to act. Otherwise, you can occlude other eye, adopt abnormal head posture. And in children, you have to be more careful because that can, there can also be MLIPI in children, particularly with the six no palsy. Because they can go for MLIPI. So you have to be very careful with that and you have to start them on alternate occlusion or whatever way you have to look after that part. I think. So in addition, you may use prisms also. So to correct that in the meantime that you want to resolve. So for smaller uh, problems in the, uh, if the person is very much uh, having a problem, then one can give prisms or as Dr. Pandey was saying, botulinum toxin can be given to expedite the recovery or to correct it for the time being that he's waiting for uh, the final thing. And of course, patching is done. And as Dr. Pandey mentioned, that in children, you have to be careful that you need to give the advice that it should be alternated between the two eyes. A unilateral patch may lead to an occlusion amblyopia. So that has to be kept in mind. Another way that we do sometimes is a simpler one, like patching may not be cosmetically acceptable by older people uh, for day-to-day uh, -day work. So in that situation, what I generally suggest is a, a nail varnish occlusion of the spectacles. So the back of the spectacles, if you apply a layer of a transparent nail varnish, transparent nail paint, uh, that works that it will give a lit, uh, I mean, blurred vision in the eye, which is paralytic and prevent the person from having diplopia without cosmetically appearing to be wearing a patch. Okay, sir. So in the last one is, uh, how long should we observe a case of paralytic strabismus before considering surgery? So, uh, as I said, that depending upon the etiology, if you are suspecting an ischemic etiology in an older person, a good a large number are going to recover about, say, 90% or so by, say, two to four months or some, you know, recover faster. And uh, so, at least six months, you have to wait. That is minimum. And, of course, if there is an intracranial tumor, or then you have that aspect also has to be seen. So, always don't look at these palsies in isolation. They are not always isolated palsies. So if it is an isolated palsy, then it is a different matter. I and mean, if it is non-isolated, then different matter. Or if it is a bilateral signal, it's a different matter, I think. So six months is minimum time it takes to recover, I think. And so well, how think... should the follow-up be in that period, like when we are waiting? So follow-up in children, if you are suspecting, like uh, young children, you need a closer follow-up. But in uh, olden, depends upon like if you are thinking of third nerve, maybe initially you need more close follow-up to see because these are, to begin with, they are partial third nerve palsies which may progress to involve and it may turn out to be a complete third nerve palsy. So these need to be maybe followed every week for one week, then every one week for one month and so on and every one month, so the, like that. But otherwise, I think um, children and the third nerve which are initially incomplete, they need more frequent follow-up. Other ones, uh, I think, may not need very close, maybe two weeks initially and then uh, every month, maybe. Amitabh, uh, so what I normally uh, tell my postgraduate, what I do also is that uh, I periodically, I mean, I, I find I either a HESU screen or I'll take a, some other modality that I can do a close follow-up and monitor my patient. If my, mon my patient is showing improvement with time, then I can extend it beyond six months also. Because if he's showing benefit, why on why on earth should I jump on and do something? You know, that six months is not some magical cutoff. But on the other hand, if he, after three months, he's not showing me any further change, then certainly by six months, I'm not likely to get any change. And I may take uh, go for a surgical decision or some other option at, the, at that point of time. Yeah. If it is not recovering, you also need to do a neuroimaging. In, in, if you are not already right. done, right. I think that's also yeah. important. Of course. Yeah. So I think we, wrap, we have wrapped up the questions for tonight. I also do want to point out that uh, sometimes it is the paralytic eye which has a better visual equity. 
and patients may sometimes present with a secondary deviation. So you see a much larger deviation. And uh, that's, you know, the initial in, uh, feeling is this is something abnormal about this eye. An oculum, all the movements are quite fine of that eye. So that, that should be also kept in mind uh, when we have these things here. Thank you so much, uh, Pandey sir, for giving us your valuable time. Any concluding remarks, Samitava sir, Pradeep sir? Because... I, I think Professor Sharma would be the right person. I missed out on a lot of this today, unfortunately. Now, I think it was a nice introductory talk on the uh, paralytic strabismus uh, that we are going to have in the uh, subsequent lectures also. So this was on the diagnostic tests, and Dr. Pandey tried to comprehensively cover all these aspects which are there, uh, right from the history and the proper examination, and then doing specific tests, and also remembering that we need to always look into the fundus for papilledema, any paralytic strabismus would be having a papilledema. The patient will not tell you anything because the vision would be normal in that first in instance. And you will have to look into the fundus to see that if there is a six nerve palsy, is there any papilledema which may be requiring specific investigations neurologically. Uh, similarly, the confrontation fields is something which I would like to add that in any case of paralytic strabismus, don't forget to do at least the confrontation fields in your clinic itself. And if you have a little bit of suspicion, then do uh, a Humphrey visual fields to uh, check for the associated neurological problems which may be there. And then you can guide your investigations. So, and he also mentioned about the ischemic mononeuropathies, which may be requiring a work, hematological workup, especially in the older people. But imaging also, he mentioned that we need to be very, very careful because imaging may be required even in, uh, in children, of course, we require to do imaging more often uh, than the adults who, we, uh, but the, even the senior citizens who are mostly likely to be having ischemic mononeuropathies, we need to follow up at least for uh, the first five days and see if it is improving, fine. If it is not improving, then there may be a neurological problem in them too. So we need to do an imaging, even in the older people, whenever we find that the, uh, either the squint is worsening, diplopia is worsening, or it's not recovering in a week or so. Uh, so your suspicion should be high for doing an imaging for these cases. I think we'll have more and more talks about in the subsequent talks. And I would like to once again thank Dr. Pradeep, uh, Pramod Pandey for uh, doing this uh, great job of this masterclass on the diagnostic test, Dr. Amitava for co-chairing, and of course, Dr. Shefali for moderating it so nicely. And uh, once again, I thank uh, the organizers of the iFocus Online for making this possible. So thank you all, and looking forward to the next subsequent lectures which Dr. Shefali is going to announce now. The next we meet on coming Friday, which is September 9th, and the lecture is going to be on third nerve palsies, the etiology, diagnosis, localization, and management by Dr. Swati. So see you all this Friday evening. Thank you and good okay. night. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pradeep, Dr. Amitava, and Dr. Shafali. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Pandey. We really, uh, you know, was looking forward to your talk, actually. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Thank I you so much. Nice to see you. Time. Yes. Nice to see you both, Dr. Pradeep, and you. Online.